everyone. It's This Week in Science, and we're, help, we're here once again to talk about science. Chop, chop, chop. Let's get to it. We're only 16 minutes after the designated start time, which is a pretty record. good for us, right? <laughs> it may be a recent record, at least. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, once again, I'm going simplified on technology, so we have no music. So uh, what? Well, oh, I can probably you have the music. Well, I can probably turn on this laptop here that's covered in a bunch of stuff because I'm moving. Oh, uh, how is that going, by the way? Yeah, I was going to ask you. When is that? <laughs> moving, moving, moving day is uh, Wednesday. Next uh -huh. Wednesday. Did you hire movers? We have movers who are coming. Oh, I need a plug. That's good. This thing, the mover's going to move the heavy stuff, and yeah, my laptop's not starting, so no music. Um, yeah, we have movers to move the heavy stuff, but I still have a lot of things to pack. I'm working on it. I try and get a little bit done every day, but it's starting to get down to the wire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you can see, you see the little cardboard boxes back here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the floor, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cardboard boxes, yeah. Moving, and then there's the child's laundry that needs to be done so that my child can have clean clothing. All these things still continue to persist. My favorite pl thing about moving is unboxing. Yeah. And when yeah. Why, when you're unboxing, like what always happens to me is I end up leaving a good half of the stuff in boxes. Like I'm like, oh yeah, here's all that stuff. I don't really need this. <laughs> Cluttering, having it places. What? Uh, tell is that? I said, I it's not tree bark. Hmm. There's something in here. It's a very fun thing. Here, I will. Oh well, don't don't open that on the air. There might be children open watching. You see? Can you see that there? Uh -huh. Oh, based on this, is there anybody shiny. in the chat room who has any idea? Yeah, it's a shiny. Lens it's a scope for your new rifle. Wait, no. It's yeah. a... Silencer. <laughs> <laughs> I, will un I will unveil the object in the wrapping at the end of the, of the show. How does that sound? Okay. Hi, Kai. Bye-bye, oh, honey. I'm doing a show right now. Kai out. Kai out. All right. Kai out. Kai out. <laughs> Drop the mic. He doesn't like it when things don't go his way. Well, yeah. Who like does? Like any of us really enjoy. Oh, yeah, hey, things didn't yeah. go my way. That's all right with me. I had wanted a promotion, <laughs> but you fired me. But that's all right. It's cool. Whatever. Whatever. What? You can't fire me because I quit. Oh, wait, that means I don't get unemployment? Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, that don't. was really not. Don't. Felt good for a moment. Now it seems like a bad idea. Mm. You want to start the show? After I do a quick commercial for McDonald's. What? <laughs> Their coffee's actually good. Mm. Like, does anybody notice it? It's like not bad. I've heard there are stories about the Mc <sighs> Mickey D's coffee. There are many. They've gone into, like, gourmet stuff. Yeah. What's weird, though, is it does have, like, ten times more sodium than just licking a, a salt cube, uh, cube. I don't know how they get the fat and the salt in to the coffee, but it's amazing. <laughs> ah, okay. Dunkin' Donut has better coffee. I don't know. I haven't tried a Dunkin' Donut coffee. You no. I don't think I have a Dunkin' no. Donut. We still have some mom and pop shop donut stores. I I in can't. Hometown. No, Dunkin' Donuts coffee is not good. They're like, how much more cream and sugar do you want in this? Yes. Which neighborhood are you moving to? Did you say? Um, Arnold. Just give us the Arnold. address so we can all Google Maps. Yeah. So right so tell me your yeah. Let's give everyone your address now. Uh, I thought it was Bernal. That's that's good. Bernal Heights. Yes. We will be moving to another hilly area, but with lots of little parks and playgrounds for the child. And mm. yeah, it'll be good. We're like blocks away from the public library. What's a library? No, library. Yes. Yeah, wow. 
One of the oh, it's one of those places where they um, it, it preserve endangered paper information. Mm -hmm. things. Yes, yeah, that's good. Yes, I have boxes of books to donate to the library. I'm going to do a library drop-off drive-by. There you go. I'm just going to run away. Go. Do the show. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following hour of programming is an attempt to prevent the future of the world from going to hell in a handbasket. While this may seem like an unlikely danger due to the rapid decline in handbaskets over the years, and the sizable size difference between the world and even the largest handbasket ever made, this is literally what we are attempting to do. This is one of the first missions of the show, one of many mission statements written down, but one of the few to survive the terrible bar napkin fire which consumed much of the show's ancient texts. And therefore, this is our only literal mission. To prevent the world of the future from going to hell in a handbasket is our most important task. But because the future of tomorrow won't be safe if weaving is allowed to continue unchecked, we therefore are filling this hour with anti-basket weaving messages in order to create a grassroots movement to ban the practice outright. Here we go, This Week in Science. Coming up next. Dun, 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 dun. You guys can sing the song, right? No. And we dance. <laughs> and we dance to the music. <laughs> it's science! Uh, but that was like the wrong song, though. Wait, that's the other one. That's the one we had before. That's a really old song. <laughs> it's science! That's still my favorite shouting of science. Science! <laughs> science! But that's not just one. This week in science! Okay, it's your turn. Let's start the show! Boom! Good science, dear Kirsten and Blair! Wow! <laughs> You've been doing some vocal exercises, haven't you? No, I do opera on the weekends. Okay, just, this? Yeah, just checking, just checking. <sighs> Welcome, everybody, to This Week in Science, where we will sing you the science news. No. Mm -mm. Well, we, well, we might break into song occasionally, but uh, yeah. Anyway, it's all about science here. That's what we try to do. And today is no exception. I want to say thanks to everyone who uh, put together a great show last week in my absence. The show must go on, right? Blair, Justin, Pamela, Ulysses, Ed. Awesome. Yeah, it was a good, good show. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Fun. Super fun. Uh, but this week we've got a lot more news, and so uh, I guess we can get started uh, to tease you a little bit about what we've got coming up. I've got a story about uh, your bacterial diet and mm, a story about feathers on dinosaurs and maybe something about the inconsistencies that we find in our very consistent universe. No. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Justin, what'd you bring? Uh, I've got uh, uh, male egos, <laughs> uh, Neanderthal human love children, and uh, there's a bunch of... I got another bacteria story, too. It might be... A, I think if it's the same one, I won't do it. We'll have to check that. If you do it first, then it's all, it's all taken care of. I think we'll, we'll figure out who gets the jump on mm -hmm. this story. <laughs> Sounding good. Blair, what'd you bring? I have a story about foodie fruit flies. Ooh. Yes, and then also another one about an animal that you could put in your gas tank. Oh, that just sounds cruel. <laughs> Is that a good idea? <laughs> Probably not. Even considering what the actual story is, but we'll talk about it later. Is it better gas money? Right. If I put yes. the animal in my tank, okay, yeah. it's going to happen. <laughs> put a monkey in your tank. Ah, uh, the gas monkeys. You got to love them. Throw them in there. Get a little bit better mileage. Back in the 50s, we used to run on run our automobiles on tigers. 
Sea monkeys and tigers. Many of them is around anymore. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, anyway, let's jump into the news. So, uh, big, big news this week is um, a discovery about uh, the speed of light, which we have talked about uh, aspects of our universe being measured as heterogeneous or not the same everywhere. And there's been this idea that, okay, the universe, all the constants are the constants that we use uh, to describe the physics of the way everything works. And so they're constant and they're going to be constant everywhere all over the universe. But there's been, there have been these hints here and there that maybe things are not as consistent in the universe as we've thought. So some researchers uh, did a study um, of light in a vacuum, which has been done before. Uh, these researchers from, uh, let's see, the University, University of Paris Sud, South Paris, Marcel Urban from that university and his team have found that the speed of light in a vacuum varies ever so slightly. That's amazing. That's not good. Right? That's, that's like, like awesome. all that's math ever that you've learned is wrong. No, no, it doesn't mean all <laughs> math is wrong. It just means that the universe is, uh, can be a little bit tricky. Yeah, so really the, the issue is that a perfect vacuum, a truly perfect vacuum, probably doesn't exist anywhere in our universe. And so um, when we observe the constants that we that we have in our universe we are observing them in this imperfect universe where there are all these bits and smudges and stars and planets and little specks of dust all over the place that can have an influence on things on uh, forces like uh, ener energetic particles or waves like light right um, so they're trying to figure out how this happens. There are uh, other researchers at the Max Planck Institute for the Physics of Light in Germany, and they have been hypothesi hypothesizing as to how uh, these the speed of light can actually vary and how it, it is a constant, but there might be some, uh, some variance to it. And they suggest that the impedance of a vac vacuum, which is another electromagnetic constant, whose value depends on the speed of light. Hmm, this doesn't seem like circular logic at all. Anyway, this is from an article in the Christian Science Mar uh, Monitor that uh, Logan Waterman sent to me. Uh, this, the impedance of a vacuum itself depends on only the electric charge of the particles in the vacuum and not their masses. And so that means that the speed of light has to come from the total number of charged particles in the universe. And so uh, we don't really know if that's correct or not. Um, but anyway, hmm. speed of light in a vacuum fluctuates ever so slightly. And uh, right, all, that would mean also the length of a meter does too, right? Well, you know, yeah, it, the, the really kind of interesting thing too then you can say is like, is it really... It's not that the speed of light itself would change, but the rate at which it travels through space can change. Right. Uh, which means that space, <laughs> right? Like, it starts to mess because we don't have, like, we got rid of absolute space. There's not these absolute distances anymore. So it's like, ah, how do you even, you're the only relation of space and distances between different particles. And if the speed of light is what we want to hinge it to, then we can say space is wibbly wobbly and doesn't, maybe space isn't a constant. <laughs> the distance cannot be a constant. And we can keep the speed of light. But so, yeah. Kiki, you said that you can never really have a perfect vacuum, right? Right. So, in theory, in a perfect vacuum, in this imaginary perfect vacuum, it might be constant? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, just, that's like when, when so physicists... So that doesn't really change any math, really. Doesn't change the math because what the first thing any any you know physics problem does if they're gonna do physics on a cow is they make the cow a perfect sphere, <laughs> right? Like mm -hmm. it becomes very uncow like in a way, and you boil it down to the essential things that are important for your calculation, and you can ignore everything else because there's infinite details on this planet anyway. 
So, yeah, it's just sort of, yeah, we, we're rounding the speed of light to the speed of light. I'm sure we're doing just fine. Yeah. Um, it's good enough. I, we're rounding it up to three anyway. So, <laughs> it's like, already not correct. Yeah. <laughs> The, uh, so from the abstracts to these two different papers, uh, the first, the quantum vacuum is the origin of the speed of light. We show that the vacuum permeability and permittivity may originate from the magnetization and the polarization of continuously appearing and disappearing fermion pairs. We then show that if we simply model the propagation of the photon in vacuum as a series of transient captures within these ephemeral pairs, we can derive a finite photon velocity. Requiring that this velocity is equal to the speed of light constrains our model of vacuum. Within this approach, the propagation of a photon is, statistical is a statistical process at scales much larger than the Planck scale. Therefore, we expect its time of flight to fluctuate. We propose an experimental test of this prediction. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So anyway, pretty cool stuff. And then the other one, a sum rule for charged elementary particles. There may be a link between the quantum properties of the vacuum and the parameters describing the properties of light propagation, culminating in a sum over all types of elementary particles ex existing in nature, weighted only by their squared charges and independent of their masses. The estimate for that sum is of the order of 100. Oh, I thought it was going to be 42. She would have guessed wrong. <laughs> would have guessed wrong. Yeah, so anyway... Um, there's another, this, this story is kind of interesting to me, additionally, because uh, my mother-in-law told me about some uh, talk that was given at the TED conference this year. Uh, I'm completely blanking on the name of the researcher who came up, but he comes up with kind of controversial ideas every so often, um, and he gave a big talk about uh, how the constants in our universe are not constant and how our universe is heterogeneous and not homogeneous and we've been modeling it as a homogeneous uh, uh, structure and he came up with all these ideas about what that tells us about our universe and more, more uh, importantly like, what that tells us about ourselves right but anyway I guess there was a big hubbub and the video got removed from the TED videos and what? you know a bunch of people were like that's not right this is not and like a bunch of people were arguing in the comments and people voted that the video should be removed so, uh -uh. Yeah. <laughs> what the that's yeah, pretty right removed, but anyway so, so yeah, yeah I mean, much, of, much of our view a lot of our view of the universe and space and, and everything has to do with being in a particular area of space and having made all of our most all of our measurements right here in the local area and we assume that things stay the same and when we do our calculations out into the universe it pretty much works so why would we assume anything could be different uh, but it could be it could be different to the point where it doesn't matter for the sort of calculations that we're doing here trying to figure out what elements are in distant stars and that sort of thing um, but it could be enough perhaps to mess, mess with some uh, you know some finite physics calculations if you were on another planet and another galaxy halfway across the, the solar system or the universe. Yeah. Uh, some another really cool story that uh, I think is very important. Learning breaks your brain. Researchers have discovered that very similar to what happens to your muscles when you go weightlifting to build muscle, mm. and you kind of damage the cells in your muscles when you use them. And that's and then they rebuild themselves and they get stronger. Researchers have actually f found DNA damage within your neurons, or not yours, but they were, I believe they were they mouse like neurons. Yeah. <laughs> mouse neurons, mice, you know, it's always ma mouse research. Mm -hmm. But pretty much when the animals used their brain to do anything to try and remember something to do stuff. they found DNA damage basically using your brain thinking learning making new connections it damages the DNA in your brain and then your 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 neurons they have to fix it you know and maybe that's part of the process of learning anyway. and, and it makes sense yeah yeah 
it's it also kind of makes me think of uh, of us, you know, humans with our. Well, I guess it's being the mice too, though. We have all intelligent species, all this sort of sentient or even animal sentience, whatever you want to call it. The mind is sort of a mutant thing, anyway. The so mind is we're mutant. all we're all just sort of brain damaged, right? Even. Everyone is everyone has brain damage to a mm -hmm. certain degree. Um, an interesting point to this story is that they were uh, studying Alzheimer's, and one of the ideas that came out of this is that um, uh, that disorders like Alzheimer's could be a result of the cells in the brain not being able to repair damage quickly enough and so things getting gummed up overwhelming the repair system and maybe some people are more likely to uh, fall into something like Alzheimer's more rapidly than than other people maybe they're because of the repairs the, the repair process that that's genetically determined environment genetics yeah I've also heard, isn't it something and this is a complete this is not science. I shouldn't. I should keep my mouth shut. But isn't it also sort of like when when the, the in Alzheimer's when the repairs are attempting to take place, uh, it's as though uh, a construction site never got cleared. You have the loose pieces of, of four by four over here. You have uh, un, half used bags of granite over there. You have the takedown where they put up a wall and needed to tear it down. There's a mm -hmm. whole bunch of extra stuff in there that right. doesn't get cleared out and then the whole site becomes unusable. So they built right. the house or they repaired the DNA for this part of the, the you know, neuron, but all the building equipment got left there and now nobody wants to use it. Yeah. Nobody wants to live there because nobody cleaned it out. It's sort yeah. of like a... Yeah. But uh, they've also, they've, uh, so all of this neural, any neural activity leads to brain damage <laughs> in your brain and researchers have uh, narrowed it down to the signaling mole molecule glutamate. So neural activity usually uh, stimulated by glutamate leads to uh, brain damage. <laughs> hey, I'm going to go read a book and get some brain damage. So I'm going to have a twist. conversation. Get some brain damage. Get some brain damage. Yes. Listen to twist. But now, but now, just... <laughs> Just a word of warning to our listeners who may not have understood the complete intricacies of this story. Simply giving yourself head trauma <laughs> does not it's make you not more intelligent. Yeah. That's not what this yeah. is. This is not. That's different. It wouldn't work the same. <laughs> yeah, totally different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so write this down. Yeah. We don't. Learning. We're not saying. Inflict head trauma, dam head damage no, on your head or your brain. No, this is a natural brain. internal process. Yeah, of yeah. little DNA bits getting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> All right, Justin, tell me a story. Oh, I need one. Hang on, let me find one. Oh, this is the story. This is the one I was most excited about. Uh, they found skeletal remains in Italy, northern Italy, some forty to three thousand years old. Believing this could be the first human Neanderthal love child. This is uh, according to the paper recently published in Close Public Library of Science One online. Uh, if this proves correct, that the remains belong to the first one of these that we found. The first one that, well, in a sense, this is slightly debatable because we know that most of us. Uh, are, Western Asian have a good two, three, maybe even four percent of Neanderthal DNA in us. Yet still, this would be this would be uh, way back in the time when Neanderthals were still on the planet. This would have been sort of in that, or shortly after in that in that uh, that time frame. From the morphology of the lower jaw, the face of Mezina, the Mezina individual, would have looked somehow intermediate between classic Neanderthal, who had a receding lower jaw, no chin, and modern humans, who have chins, apparently. Um, this is... Where did they find this guy? Genetic analysis shows the individual's mitochondrial DNA is Neanderthal. Since this DNA is transmitted from mother to child, the researchers conclude 
It was a female Neanderthal who mated with male Homo sapiens. Interesting. Wow. Mm. Interesting. So, does that mean that there were some hottie female Neanderthals out there? Probably. I, That's an extrapolation. <laughs> or yeah, it could have been the, the last, you know, you know. Or were the male humans at the time just not very picky? <laughs> Back then? By the time modern humans arrived in the area, Neanderthals had already established their own culture, the Mousterian, which lasted some 200,000 years. Numerous flint tools, axes, spear points have been associated with this culture. Like we've talked about on the show, too, there have been, uh, we found Neanderthals on islands that would have been 20, you know, miles from shore. They haven't found any any boats, any Neanderthal boats, but they can't figure out how else they would have gotten there in, in that period of time to have had their culture there. Um, they've had burnt offerings, uh, ceremonial burials, jewelry. They use plants for medicines. They, they had quite a, quite a decent culture going. Uh, researchers in this found that the hybridization between the two hominoid species likely took place. The Neanderthals continued to hold up their own cultural traditions. Kind of makes sense yeah. there, though, because they would have been the more entrenched culture, and it would have been all these immigrant humans that were sort of finding their way in the new land. So, yeah, I, as much history on what plants to eat and not eat, and what sorts of things were made medicine, what have you. Yeah, I just, I just have to wonder. You know, usually in, uh, you know, mating systems, the female is the choosier of the two sexes, right? Mm. So, you know, was the, were the females making the choice that they are, oh, I'm going to take that. This is something different. This could be cool. Or was it a culture or a culture where, you know, it was beat the woman over the head, drag her off and, you know, or leave was her, it leave her uh, pregnant. beat the I man over the head and drag him to the cave? <laughs> because, <laughs> right. you know, uh, female Nantos were involved in the hunt. Uh, they weren't your typical stay-at-home gatherer chicks. They were out there, you know, working, working for, you know, hunting mammoth or whatever. They, I don't even know what they went after. But they were involved in the in the hunt right alongside the men. They didn't have uh, much of a delineation in those duties, from what I've. From what I've seen. Yeah. I don't know. I just I love that we're finding more and more evidence of cross cultural influences. Is that a PC way to put it? <laughs> Between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, and it's just there's a, the, the tapestry of the story is growing so much richer, and we might eventually find out exactly what kind of you know dating habits there were. Or, or this could have been a rape. Like, you know, exactly, it could this have is been. The, we right. don't have any. I mean, I wouldn't speculate. Too the, human male, the Homo sapien males immigrating in, mm -hmm. not having a lot of their own kind there, not having entrenched culture. They're probably traveling in these little scraggly groups, not as large groups. Oh, and probably weak, you know, weak uh, non hunting women probably falling right. to the wayside. You know, in right. And so time. you come into an area where there are. But there, you know, there are people and uh, these kind of uh, interloper males on the edges. I could imagine that they would come in, you know, take an opportunity when that arose, and then be out of there. So this area, though, uh, okay, they, they also found modern humans living in southern Italy uh, in a cave as early as forty-five thousand years ago. They were saying modern humans, Neanderthals, therefore lived in Italy. Uh, for basically the same region for thousands of years. So, you know, they had a good long time to, with the cultures, either get along or not get along, uh, figure things out and have peace intermingle or be at war. They've had plenty of opportunity to sort of exercise all of these behaviors. Maybe, and probably all of them at some point. Yeah. All right, Blair. Give us a little news from the Animal Corner. Yay! Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. Works at a zoo, fond of hippos, not so much of pandas and squirrels. That's right. All right, well, 
So here's what I've got. First off, let's talk about fruit flies and organic food. Mm. So we've talked about organic food on the show quite a few times, and I think most recently we had said that uh, there was a study that came out that said there was no nutritional difference between organic and non-organic food. I think that was the latest one that we had. But there's been lots of studies both ways with this, and it's kind of this weird gray area still. We're not sure what's going on. So this is really cool, um, especially because a high school student did the m uh, major elements of the research in this uh, study. So this, this high school student s seems super interested in this whole debate between organic food and normal food uh, that you could buy at the grocery store and what really is the difference there. And so her teacher allowed her to carry out this entire experiment and he helped her publish. So she has her name on a published piece of science, which I think is awesome. but. So what they did is they took uh, fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster, uh, you know, as is used for everything. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're like the duct tape of uh, of <laughs> lab animals besides mice, I guess. But so what they did is they gave some of them just the normal grocery food, store food. So they actually went to a grocery store and bought some things that were labeled organic and then some things that were labeled not, or not labeled organic. And they fed two different groups of flies uh, on the respective diets. And then they ha they put them through a starvation cycle to basically put stress on them and see what happened. And that way they're trying to replicate, you know, normal fly life, I guess. But so in, in the end, what they found was that these flies were healthier on the organic food. And they measured how healthy they were for many different parameters, but the two most important parameters, if you're a fly or most animals, longevity and fertility, they were both much better in both factors on the organic food. Hmm. Now, the thing that needs to be looked at more after this, kind of as a follow-up, is that it looks like they only used one or two food items. I know they said grapes for one of them. I don't remember what the other one was, but it's possible that some foods benefit from being organic and other foods don't. But right. they also said that they did look into the nutri nutrients in these food items afterwards, and it appeared to be a negligible difference. They were pretty much the same. So there's something going on with organic versus non-organic that may not be nutrients, there might be something else that is making these flies healthier and potentially could be beneficial to us. Right. And, and yeah. the, the thing, too, is the organic versus non-organic typically has to do more with the farming process than right. it has to do with the actual end result product. Right. So... And even the, even the study that it came up saying that uh, organic isn't you know, any better than conventional. Uh, that, that study itself had a lot of co uh, caveats saying that, you know, they didn't look at individual types of, of plants, of foods, of fruits, of vegetables that could be have, have certain differences, and there were a lot of things that they probably still could have teased out. And so this mm -hmm. is probably right in line with that. Yeah, and you're also likely to still find uh, pesticides and even DDT residues in the organic foods, depending on who's yeah. doing the organic farming. I mean, if you have large-scale farms that have decided to tap into the organic market, they let the field sit for two years without doing any <clears throat> uh, insecticides or any of the traditional non-organic farming techniques, and then they can call that land organic, anything they grow on it, even though it's been used with pesticides for 50 years. Right. This is where you get the large-scale um, farming things. So they're growing the same stuff. They're, they're, their end product also isn't likely to be any different uh, and may still even have the residue. So maybe it's, maybe it's residue from the, from the non-organic that was hindering the fruit flies, but of course they didn't do the drill down on that yet or yeah. not that as a parameter, so we have no idea. 
it definitely could have been that. There's a million other things also that could yeah. be a factor depending on what kind of organic farm you are. Mm -hmm. Some organic farms rotate their crops. When you rotate crops, the soil is better and a lot of the times you get better food. Uh, there's any number of things that you could look at mm -hmm. and find actually what is making these organic foods better than the non-organic. And I, I just think it's very interesting uh, in that it proves there is more to be looked at here. Right. And, a and lot of people want to say it's just um, like an advertising thing where yeah. organic is hip, organic is eco-friendly, organic is something that you want to be seen buying maybe instead of your normal food. But it looks like there is something beneficial going on and we have to figure out what exactly that is. And, right. and to the credit, the uh, researchers involved in this project, they're probably, you know, for not having looked at every angle, um, their response might be something along the lines of, dude, we had enough funding to go to the Whole Foods market, yeah. just grab two pieces of produce from a regular <laughs> grocery store, and we had a handful of flies. This is what our budget was, okay? We didn't I think it's great. I think it's a great preliminary study. It, it gives us the idea that there's something to be looked at more. Mm -hmm. And with such a, a more simple, potentially, organism, such as fruit flies, then you look at the more complex, like mammals, like us, there, there's a lot of things that could potentially be going on. And I'm just going to shout out really quick, too, speaking of organic and pesticides and all this stuff, there was another study uh, in the news this week that I did, I didn't have time to include, but I would urge everyone to look it up about pesticides and honeybees. Oh, and God. Yeah, memory and loss. it turns out that the pesticides, yeah, they make the bees lose their memory and uh, just reduce their brain to the point where they can barely recognize a, a flower to pollinate. Right. Well, I mean, one of the big questions about what happens with uh, the, um, you know, the the bees disappearing from their hives when they're when they get sick, you have the, they've there has been the fungus uh, influence. There's also the thought that pesticides are doing something and the bees go away and never come back. They're, so they're probably just forgetting how to get back to their hives. Mm -hmm. it's certainly that's, possible. Yeah. That's sad. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> so the solution would be to create a lot more hives and just have hives everywhere so all these absent-minded yes. bees can just find a home. Yeah, that's find true, a but place to if live. they can't find their flowers to pollinate either, then we'll kind of lose yeah. all of our plants. Yeah, and and well, and the big part there too is is not just for an individual because they have they sent out they send out searcher bees who go out and find all this stuff. And the, the amazing thing about bee communication is they come back to the hive, and they tell the rest of the hive it's two shakes to the left, then you go down about this far, then you take a right, and then look circle around a couple times, and you'll find these really good things to eat. If they come back and they're like, all right, oh, wait, what was it? Okay, ah, uh, I think you take a left at the tree, <laughs> uh, or is it a right? The whole rest of the hive's like, ah, oh, we have nowhere to go search for food today. This totally stinks. Yeah. So, so yeah, no, that, that would massively impact the populations. I can totally Definitely. see that as, as a pretty, yeah, pretty clear problem. Yeah, so all in all, what we've learned today, pesticides, not good. <laughs> Yeah. Which we kind of knew already. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, real quick, the other story that I brought today is about an animal that they found to be an alternative fuel source. Does anyone want to guess where this animal's found? Um, is it in the ocean? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's a is tunicate. It algae? It's no, a what? It's a tunicate. It's not an algae? Oh. Tunicate called acidia, ac, acidiasia. Acidiasia, we'll say. You're welcome. It's fine. But what was the. <laughs> wait, it's wait, a, what's it, what is it called? It's a. What tunicate. Kind of, what's a. I don't know. I've, no, I've never. It sounds like a fish, but I doubt that's right. It's not. It's. Uh, <laughs> what family is it in? Kiki? No? Tunicate? I'm, this, yeah, hold on, hold on. I'm gonna get look it, it up. I forget. Tunicates, uricordata or uricordates yes. are members of the tunicata, a subphylum of the phylum chordata. Tube worms, basically, they're marine tube. filter feeders with the sac-like uh -huh. morphology. I thought it was tube worms, but I was afraid I was wrong. So I wasn't gonna say it. I was it. way off. This is it because that's all I the mean, marine that, animals. You, you, you plant really more than a. Uh, so <laughs> we're gonna run our 
Cars so anyway. with tube worms? Yeah, so tuna kits. They're filter feeders. Now, this is important. I'm going to come back to this later. These are filter feeder animals. They think they can be used as biofuel and as fish food. Okay. Mm -hmm. So at the University of Bergen, um, they, they took these animals and successfully used them to fuel some things and also you know came up with a high nutrient fish feed for them out of that so they got ethanol from these things wow yeah there's a large amount mm -hmm. of protein in the tuna kit and omega-3s the protein and omega-3s are good for the fish feed and there's ethanol in there that they can extract so they figured why not <laughs> and um they were awarded money for their discovery, which is great. Uh, we should definitely encourage the researchers out there. They got some prize money, but they they already have a patent for their bio biofuel, and have a patent application pending for the cultivation of the tuna kits as fish feed. And they say that they're particularly suitable because um, it it's something that they can grow fairly easily it's easy to break down and synthesize and um, also they're calling it environmentally friendly because it's better than chopping down trees okay I'm with you uh -huh. there it does not occupy large tracts of land but if you're raising it in water it takes up water okay <laughs> salt water uh, yes so, so you have to either use existing wild areas or take up land to build saltwater tanks to <laughs> right. build to grow the tunicates right and this is the part that really gets me are you ready they said the tunicates are not in the food chain because they have a protective mantle and there are no creatures that eat them the tunic their tunic would be protective right, right? very hard so wait, nothing eats them. Nothing eats them, but those of us that know what a food chain, or more properly, what a food web is, mm. just because something doesn't eat you, it doesn't make you not part of the food chain. Right. They and definitely, they definitely, feeder. they feed on other smaller creatures. Yeah, and they're a filter feeder. They're taking detritus out of the environment and cleaning up the ocean, essentially, by being there. And I just personally feel <laughs> like replacing fossil fuels with an animal, what's going to happen? All the animals are going to be gone. We're going to harvest this animal to extinction or close to it. We're going to probably pollute waters trying to raise them and cultivate them. And we're going to remove this filter feeder from its environment. I'm sorry, no. I don't care if nothing eats I, you. You're still part of the food web. You're still part uh, of the environment. You've survived through all of the stages of evolution for a reason. and For people to use you. Right, okay. <laughs> well, well, if you look at the history of animal husbandry in farming, you'd, you'd actually, what's more, more, much more likely then they get wiped out and or anything like that or get pulled out of the environment and harvested out. It's much more likely in this day and age that there will be just way too many of them. Again, I I, I promise you there are more cows, or we'll chickens, breathe them. And But they're not how they planet. were originally. All those animals are not how they originally were, and they're not in their ecosystem fulfilling their place in the food web anymore. This is true. So if we take them out of the environment, maybe use breeding or genetic engineering to make them even better for what we want them for, and then the original is gone, what's going to happen to our ocean ecosystem? Well, why would we take the originals away? Why don't we just take, take their ones. children, make new ones? <laughs> That's <laughs> the good. darkest thing I've ever heard you say, Kirsten. Why don't we just take their children? Their children. <laughs> right. Take their children from them. Yeah. Oh, um, and but there's some... a lot of problems with that. I mean, if you are raising them in giant saltwater tanks, where's all the waste going from these millions of tunicates? Um, all of the cleaning products from cleaning out the tanks and just um... listen to this. Listen to this. Yes. According to Wikipedia, tunicates, which some species are alternatively known as uh, sea squirts. Sea right, squirts. sea squirts. Sea squirts. Oh. Um, sea squirts. 
tunicates contain a host of potentially useful compounds, including didemonin, didemnins, which are effective against various types of cancer as antivirals and immunosuppressants. Aplidine, which is effective against various types of cancer. Trebectidin, effective against various types of cancer. And Stanford University researchers in 2007 showed that tunicates over several generations can correct ab uh, abnormalities. Jeez. So uh, that uh, implies that a similar corrective mechanism might be possible for humans. So you're saying if we did start raising these things and we have a bunch of leftover stuff, that could be used to experiment on and get some new uh, fancy drugs. Right. Mm -hmm. My gas tank is also going to fight my cancer and help me regrow my left pinky toe. Great. Great. That's good. <laughs> wow. But then what happens if they breed them and all of that stuff is gone because they've bred in only enough that they can, you know, get all the ethanol they want out of them and then all of our uh, cancer fighting elements are gone. There will never be enough ethanol. I just have to, you know. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, I, th I think rather than finding a new source for ethanol, it's time to We move. the people will find a source for our energy needs wherever we can. No matter who it hurts. Yeah. Right. And on that wow, note... that's the second darkest thing I ever heard <laughs> So anyway, yeah, animals in your gas tank. Think about it. Think I'm not super about comfortable it. with it. Sea <laughs> gas tank. That's right. I'm going to start a gas, gas station brand called Sea Squirts. Mm -hmm. Tank Squirts. Um... I was going to say, on that note, it is almost time for us to take a break. Um, additionally, dark things are happening here in the United States. Write our government and tell them that you're upset about the sequester because it is causing things like NASA to stop all education and outreach activities while they figure out how to make up the difference in their budget that they're not getting. So, write your Congress people. Tell them they need to get their act in gear because NASA has a lot to teach us. Right? Right. And now we take a break. Yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Yeah, exactly. Like audiobooks? You can get audiobooks and help twist out at the same time. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 100,000 titles in their library. And a lot of them are science books. You're here listening to a science podcast. We're sure that you'll find something like a science book to listen to. And that's the whole point. You can listen to it, take, you, take it where you want, when you want. Enjoy your education on your own time, in your own way. Sign up right now for an Audible uh, account. An Audible account. You go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist. That's audiblepodcast.com slash twist. Sign up for an account, and you will not only help twist out because we get a little kickback every time someone signs up, you will also get a free audiobook download just for signing up. Sign up, help twist, get something for free. Do it now. Audiblepodcast.com slash twist. If audiobooks are not your thing, but you still want to help us out, we have some merchandise. If you go to twist.org, our website, you can find a link to our Zazzle.com store. That's right, Zazzle.com. We have a store that is full of t-shirts, hats, sweatshirts, Christmas ornaments, that kind of stuff. They have the Twist logo all over the place, all over them, and uh, hopefully we'll have some new stuff when, I get a, when we have a minute to design it and put it in the account. But there's stuff there. Go check it out. Wear a T-shirt that screams your love for twists all over it. That go to go to twist.org, find our zazzle.com store, and buy something. Help us out. You don't like merch, you don't like books, you can still help us by donating. So go to twist.org, and we've made it very easy for you. We have little pink donation buttons all over the website, along the sidebar, at the bottom of every show page. So you can go to the most recent episode that's up on the website listen to the show, and check out the show notes. And in the process, maybe click on one of those pink donation buttons and help us out a little bit. We really couldn't do this without you. Thank you for your support.
And we're back. This is This Week in Science, and we have lots more science news because we still have the last half of the show to get through. I'm glad Justin's coming back so that we can get on with the show because the show never stops in the science world. People are always trying to figure things out. Right? What? Why yes. would they do that? Anywho, Justin, you're back. You want to tell a story? Once upon a time in a land far, far... Wait, no, that's the wrong story. Hey, here's an interesting one. Uh, weigh in on this as you may. Story here, headline, is uh, this is right off the Yahoo Science News, which, I'm, by the way, very happy that they've separated science and technology in yeah. both the Yahoo and the Google um, news feeds. Is those are totally different things. It's sort of like, let's put the sports and travel into the same section. It's, they are very different. Uh, the, the headline here is, Men Get Ego Boost from Workplace Power. It says uh, men reap more rewards from having power in the workplace than women do, new research is showing. The University of Toronto study revealed benefits of having more authority in the office, including greater job control, higher earnings, are not evenly distributed for men and women, which I think we are probably all aware of. The researchers also found that the men who achieved the highest levels of structural power more, were more likely to perceive their jobs as more autonomous and influential. In addition, even when the men in the study shared a similar, similar level of authority in the workplace, they were more likely than women to feel they had decision-making freedom and a greater influence over what happens on the job. <clears throat> and we've all probably had both male and female bosses at some point, so you can all sort of vie that against your own personal experience. Uh, we know what job resources like authority and uh, autonomy or Income tend to bundle together. Yeah, this is one of the researchers in this. And yet our research suggests that the bundling of these job rewards continue to differ from for men and women. And I wonder if I wonder if it's something psychologically just different about the way men and women approach work. Mm -hmm. Or is a side conversation we were having earlier, if um, because the that we know that there's a pay difference, typically even in the shared roles. If that is part of why men feel a little bit more empowered in the workplace than women, is it is that a possibility? The patterns we discover suggest that even when women lean in and attain greater authority at work, the structural features of power have different consequences for the subjective experience of autonomy and influence in ways that favor men. Hmm. Do you feel favored here at Twist, Justin? Me? No, I'm just a Do the ladies who... intimidate you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no um, but I, I tell you, I, I, uh, I, I and this, this show does, I don't think this show's work, first of all. No. So, right. um, this is play. This is fun. <laughs> but, but in the workplace, uh, over the years, when I was thinking about this story, I have noticed, I can look back and say, you know, the approach to authority uh, for women in, in roles of authority always seemed to me that they are trying to be leaders and uh, be, good, be good leaders in the workplace. Whereas in contact, you know, this is all personal experience and my own job histories and stuff, so there's nothing to do with this story. But it does fit that uh, the men were much, much more authoritative and I'm the boss, and therefore, this is the, what you you are tasked to do. Well, First. yeah, it, it definitely could have something to do with uh, uh, communication and how mm -hmm. women are uh, brought up to communicate and how we communicate naturally, uh, where we... It's been shown that even from a very young age, girls do much better in a group learning experience. Boys do much better when they're separated and it's kind of uh, more individual and even more hierarchical. Um, women do a lot better when there's collaboration as opposed to um, just being, you know, told what to do. Um, 
there there are a lot of psychological differences between men and women that I'm sure would lead to patterns of how they approach authority roles and you know and I, and I don't think that you're you know you're wrong in your suggestion that uh, that salary is gonna you know not gonna have something to do with it either I mean if you go into a role and you know that your male counterpart is making you know 10 20 percent more than you and doing the same job you're just gonna be like oh, okay no matter how hard you work you're never gonna get you know to the same level as you know the guy next to you Hot Rod, Hot Rod in the chat room uh, makes an outstanding uh, observation. The boss's wife has as much, if not mm -hmm. more, power on the job. Just saying, there is that's like a whole separate study, though, because like, <laughs> that there is there's a weird power dynamic that can happen there that uh, doesn't exist um, in in a normal. Uh, I've I found them in the past to be even more or uh, authoritative. <laughs> the actual men in the position of being the boss, but because maybe they have to be, or maybe, and this to is to maintain their position and ha and get respect, or they they think they have to be to be right. able to get respect from. Right. It's amongst. like an overcorrection. Yeah, right. it's an overcorrection because I mean, and this is again, this is any those compensation really. Thing. But yeah, right. Like, um, I'm not actually in this job place, and I may not even have a job. I'm the boss's wife. Why do I have to work? But when I do come to work, I'm going to show them I mean business. And it can be completely out of context from the day-to-day -day grind of the thing. But, you know. Yeah. Um, and Insider says, meh, Dr. Kiki reinforcing gender stereotypes. They are stereotypes, absolutely. Yeah. But there have been numerous studies that actually have shown that there are differences in learning behavior between girls and boys and differences in communication strategies between girls and boys that persist throughout uh, throughout their development to adulthood. This doesn't mean that every single girl or boy falls into these uh, determined these mm -hmm. stereotypes. Of course not. But right. you know what we're doing is uh, every once in a while you do kind of have to lump groups of people into right. statistical curves. Yeah, and not all stereotypes are accurate, but a lot of them come from somewhere. Right. Yeah. There's something going on that makes people come up with a stereotype a lot of the time. I think also, uh, I have read a story, um, some info before, some data about how it is uh, statistically, I don't know the exact statistics or the exact situation, but it is statistically more difficult for women to get into those roles to begin with. Mm-hmm when they have male competition for management roles. And so I just wonder if women are more appreciative of where they are and appreciate being in the lower ranks because perhaps they've had to work harder to get where they are. Or yeah, and just have to be that much better of a leader yes, to yeah. have even been in contention for the exactly. I, can, I can think of a few jobs that I've had where I felt like I had to overcompensate because I didn't have the physical strength, let's say, of a man that had the same job. Right. And I just have to remind everyone that we will continue to have these conversations because we are, we're not that far out of uh, the point where women were not allowed into the workforce, you know, where women were, on, the only jobs they could do were, beside being a mom, a homemaker, were being a nurse, a teacher, or a secretary. Mm -hmm. And we've come a long way, baby. I mean, the feminist movement of the '70s isn't that far behind us. And we've, and speaking of compensation, there are a lot of people who don't talk about this stuff anymore because yeah. it's like, oh, feminist, you said that word. What you know? The reaction well, but, yeah. is very negative because people got very militant about, hey, we should have equal rights, you know, and. Right. We should be treated equally in the workplace. Although, yeah, and, if, and women are still paid less than men for the same jobs. Uh -huh. That is yeah. truth. And, and there are there's still, still legislation fewer... going, trying to go through yeah. our government that gets stopped to try to make payment fair in all right. jobs, and it gets right. stopped. <laughs> and additionally, I, I there are gonna... there's very few women in Fortune 500 companies in the the CEO. Or uh, the executive roles. Yeah, but uh, I, and all of those are great, uh, great things to point out. The only data point correlative I would just throw out there that if we're going to someday have this conversation, 
uh, out in the open is that uh, I think the economy worked a lot better when uh, women didn't work. There was a lot more competition for the you have, uh, you have for gotten, pay and for you workers. You have said this before. Your whole it's sort of like about doubling maybe, the workforce in a matter of a decade, and of course the economy is going to suffer. Now it does take a two-household income where it could have been one. Justin, and I think we just had a good stop. Deal, and I think we You've gone here back. before, and it is just the most wrong-headed <laughs> place, my, and just shut your I, mouth. It's not even my opinion. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's less about that. It's more about this thing called inflation. I yeah. think that's really what happened. That was created women by came into the, work the labor force. force. Women but, came into the right. You, your point. I, you said it before. You say women came into the workforce, doubled the workforce, competition for jobs. So maybe women could keep should keep working and guys can stay home. That's what I'm saying. Can we go the other way? We know. could stay home and you could work. You, I think it's it fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think okay, I well, could then, start Are you going to carry the baby for nine months as well? <laughs> after. I'll carry it for the next nine. Uh, I'll tell you that. Like, right? Like. <sighs> oh, boy. All right. <laughs> Moving on. I have stories. I have stories to talk about. Let's talk about science. I know. We obviously got into some kind of a psychological hot button there, didn't we? Uh, how do you want to lose weight? How about the bacterial way? Ooh. Have you been considering um, maybe having a lap band put on? You, you know, you, you've reached a point where uh, gastric bypass surgery is maybe uh, where you're headed. Well, researchers publishing in Science Translational Medicine uh, have started trying to figure out what exactly is behind a lot of the weight loss that happens. They've noticed that in people and also laboratory animals who have gastric bypass surgeries that the makeup of the bacteria in their uh, in their gut biota and also the, the, the feces that come out after the operation dramatically changes. And so is it the operation and that change that causes it? Is it the you know change in food what happens to lead to this change in bacteria and do the bacteria actually have anything to do with the weight loss that occurs and they've actually found that the the species of the bacteria that uh, that change are uh, are fairly standard so within one week of sur surgery in by bypass induced um, my obese mice three phylogenetic groups of microbes, bacteriodetes, vericomicrobia, and proteobacteria were enriched in the mouse poos. Five weeks after, the restructuring of the, the populations of microbes had stabilized, and mice lost 30% of their body weight and exhibited metabolic changes so that uh, the, the weight loss uh, resulted in uh, lower blood glucose levels, changes to insulin sensitivity, and they were able to tie about 5% of the body weight loss specifically to bacteria. And they calculate that microbiota transfer could account for upwards of 20% of the effects of the surgery. So maybe in the future, you won't have to have the surgery, but they will induce a change in your mi gut microbe populations, and that will help you lose weight and get so healthier. Just the nature of cutting into somebody changes their bacteria? No, not, I mean, not just cutting into somebody. There's, I mean, it's a, it's a dramatic change that takes place when you do a, a bypass surgery. Uh -huh. There's, you know, there's a bypass there's, they're taking out a significant uh, chunk of the uh, the intestine, the small intestine, and just bypassing it. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be uh, less surface area for uh, for absorption of food, of nutrients, um, right. less room. That the there's going to just be a dramatic shift as a result of that change to the environment. But they don't know exactly what leads to it. So they don't know why this surgery changes your gut bacteria, but it just does. Yeah, yeah. so uh, one of the researchers says, we began to see in patients that got bypass surgery that they were not hungry and that they were not craving what they used to crave. 
uh, energy expenditure goes up rather than down. So everything about bypass surgery seems to be the opposite of what would happen with a diet. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting, just an interesting effect, and there is some causal link between the microbial gut community, how it changes, and the weight loss that occurs. So, I, I mean, invasive surgery, I think, should usually be one of the last, uh, mm -hmm. you know, last things that you do. I mean, it, you're going to be put to sleep. There's a lot of risk in all the, in, in having any kind of surgery. So... Right. If you can reduce that and just, you know, have a, you know, microbial population of fecal transfer to your gut, if you could have um, bacterial probiotics that you take, you or, know, that would or be you pretty could awesome. Just, you could just eat your fruits and vegetables. But that's not always the whole the whole part problem. But but. Uh, as I'm about to uh, behavioral to changes are sometimes the hardest things to do. So right, but if if you want to take the the microbial approach, your fruits and vegetables might be the best source. Recent study here showing fresh fruit and vegetables carry an abundance of bacteria on their mm. surfaces, not bacteria that are causing disease, just uh, good flora. And the first study to assess a variety of these non pathogenic pathogenic bacteria, scientists report that these surface bacteria are depending on the type of produce and cultivation practices. Remember the story earlier about the fruit flies. This might come back right in here. Study, study focused on 11 produce types that are often consumed raw. Found that certain species like spinach, tomatoes, strawberries have very similar surface bacteria with the majority of these microbes belonging to one family. Meanwhile, fruits like apples, peaches, and grapes have more variable surface bacterial communities from three to four different groups. Authors also found differences in the surface bacteria between produce grown uh, doing, using what is now traditional versus organic farming practices. The authors suggest several factors may contribute to the differences they observed, uh, blah, blah, blah. So in this, in this, yeah, they found the organic labeled produce had significantly greater richness of bacterial uh, variation compared to the conventional labeled produce like on spinach, lettuce, tomatoes, and uh, was significantly lower in richness uh, on peaches and grapes. Maybe this Results explains the results that Blair was talking about earlier. Exactly, right? So mm -hmm. maybe, maybe the thing the final equation of why the, the fruit flies were living longer could have been they were getting exposed to more bacterial variation and had nothing to do with the pesticides themselves. Yeah, and maybe the pesticides and the, the stuff that we use, you know, maybe it's too it gets aggressive. rid of, maybe it's, yeah, it's too aggressive. It gets rid of good bacteria that mm -hmm. help, help us digest, that help us get more nutrients, that help make the food as, as good for us as possible as nutritious as possible because that's what we're learning a lot about is that there are all these bacteria that end up in our guts and they help us digest stuff. And they can inhibit the production of, of pathogenic uh, bacteria, right? Yes. So they will be in there competing for your, the, you know, the space in the gut. They will compete so you don't have to. Yes. Yes. This is kind of what I was going to ask you, though, about the gastric bypass thing is, do they know that it's the surgery that's causing the bacteria change, or is it the fact that these people, after they do the surgery, a lot of the time they change their lifestyles also, they change the things that they eat, yeah. and that would change your gut bacteria. Right. That, that would, but if you, uh, I mean, whenever you're having a surgery, they're probably hitting you with a lot of antibiotics so you don't get, also so you don't get infections and right. blah, blah, blah. So it's probably a good one, two punch there. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would imagine. I think the, uh, the interesting thing about it is that, you know, you'd think you reduce the amount of surface area and, you know, and, uh, real estate within your stomach and your gut for getting nutrients into your body, which it's the same. It should be the same as just reducing the amount of food you eat, mm -hmm. except you don't have to. And with the gastric part, they like, uh, they cut the bottom. I think it's they cut the bottom of the stomach or something. And so it, 
your stomach is smaller, and so mm-hmm. you're you're not you're not supposed to be as hungry, and it shouldn't change your bacteria. I mean, you wouldn't think that it would change the the bacteria. So maybe Justin's right that maybe there is a resetting because of the antibiotics that you're on for the surgery, and then that added to you're eating less, and maybe you're eating diff. I don't know. I have no idea, but they don't know. <laughs> They're trying to figure it out. That's interesting. Right? Mm. Yeah. Mm. So interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I have a question for you guys. So I read a story uh, that was sent to me by Virgil Cor- Corrilado over on Twitter, and it's a story over on Verge that Jurassic Park is going to be coming out with a new sequel within the series. Jurassic Park 4 is coming out next summer. And between the time that Jurassic Park 1 came out and now, we have learned a lot about raptors, velociraptors, T-Rexes, dinosaurs that were featured in Jurassic Park. We know that they had feathers, right? And they were very colorful, and there were all these things about them that we have learned since the the franchise got started. The director of uh, of JP4 made a Twitter post says no feathers, hashtag JP4, and uh, people are thinking that he doesn't care what science says that he's going to stay stay with the traditional view of dinosaurs and raptors from uh, the original movies. What do you guys think? Should the Hollywood movie update? Well, thankfully, in the years since that movie and this movie, not only has our scientific understanding of dinosaurs improved, so has our computer rendering ability. Oh, so I know. Feathers yeah. should be no problem, right? They can do smoke. Like before, smoke was like, yeah, you can render anything but smoke. That's a, pff, that's impossible. And now they can do that, no problem. So yeah, I say uh, slap on the feathers. The tough part then is deciding where to put them and how many and what colors. It's a lot of artistic license that I think somebody could handle. Yeah, uh, there's a, uh, a science writer who has a blog over at National Ge- Geographic, and I think we've spoken with him before, Brian Switek. His blog's uh, Laylaps, and he's a paleontologist. He wrote, There is something undeniably unsettling and scary about envisioning a velociraptor cleaning blood from its colorful plumage after a kill. Mm. <laughs> yeah, right? I, mean, I just have just... one thing to say. One thing. It's a movie. <laughs> There is that. I totally I agree. Like, there is that. I feel like they've they've they have a standard that they've set, especially for this brand of movie. And I think it would be kind of weird. I think well, it's probably just weird that they're releasing another one after it's been what ten years. But it would be kind of odd that all these other ones they looked a certain way, and then all of a sudden, oh no, we're gonna give them feathers. I understand. It's a film. It's fiction. There's no real Jurassic Park. Make them look like whatever you want. I'm sure there's a. They didn't sound like what they make them sound like either. It's just kind right. of. It's movie magic. It's eh, whatever. It is. It is movie magic. But at the same time, I think people who uh, are you know commenting on it, uh, I think they're. I think they're kind of right. I mean, this is a chance to get something kind of accurate Mm -hmm. about the past in front of a really large audience in a way that isn't slamming science down their throats, but will have an impact. And it can actually improve the visual experience of the film. So, I think I think there's going to be pushback. I think it's going to take a while for the general public to accept a dinosaur with feathers. I don't think they're ready, to be honest. I feel like there's bad. there's a lot of people that that if they see that, they're going to laugh at it because that's not what a dinosaur has looked like for their entire life. I think if we start with the children's books, this is my plan. <laughs> you start with the children's books. If the children's books have dinosaurs with feathers in them, then maybe in 10 or 15 years they'll be ready ready for a dinosaur with feathers in a movie. But it's these people who have spent the past 30, 40, 50 years of their life looking at these leathery 
reptilian dinosaurs, that they're not going to want to accept a dinosaur with feathers on it. Okay, so I, I can kind of understand that. The people that. who don't want to accept that Pluto is not a planet planet anymore. I mean, Let's, there are all these things that happen. Science changes. We right. find out new information about the world. The world is not a static place, people. No, I but, feel like we're not the key demographic for this film. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> we probably aren't, but I think that they should at least... Okay, so the dinosaurs they've profiled before for the continuity thing, absolutely. I think I'm with you on that. Let's not like reinvent the dinosaurs that they've already shown on screen. But they should make an effort to have like the feathered dinosaur cameo. Mm. You know that what I mean? Be one, right? Yeah, I agree they, with that. they that need at sense. least to include that. I think would be would be excellent, even if they don't redo any of the Velociraptor or the T Rex or anything like that. Find something that you can toss into the mix that is got the plume and the feathered dinosaur thing going on, and I think that would be sufficient. Yeah, <laughs> I think that sounds good. I'm on board with that. <laughs> Ease it in. I think that's the thing. You can't just drastically say dinosaurs forever yeah. now will have feathers. The, the public will not accept it. You have to ease the public in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm tired of the public. And if you're just tuning in, this is This Week in <laughs> Science, easing it into the public on a <laughs> weekly basis. <laughs> Dinosaurs had feathers! What there happened to the first electric car? It was not in a monkey. This is not a monkey. This is all I'm saying. When the scientists figure these things out, the public don't accept it right away. It just, it just doesn't happen. You have dinosaurs to take, are not dead. You have to They're introduce a hybrid first, and then another hybrid, and another hybrid, and then maybe an electric car. You mean like an evolution? Yeah. <laughs> Big bird I'm is just a saying humans are kind of stubborn, and they don't like to accept change in general. I know. I know. I don't like to accept that people don't like change. Change is good. Mm -hmm. change There's is bad change. I'm though. moving. I'm very excited about I this. I embrace all change. Really? It's like, it's like we're a shark. If we stop moving, we will die. Ah. Well, it's that, you know, if you find yourself comfortable in life, I mean, it really kind of means that you're not improving anymore, right? Yes. So change, while being difficult, also means that you are challenging yourself and you're accepting learning new things about the world. So as hard as it is, change is good. Mm. Words from This Week in Science. Uh, you had a quick uh, world robot domination story, is that right? And then we can head on out of here? Yeah, sure. Um, I wanted to screen share it, actually. So do let it. me. Do you want me to do it while you talk? Uh, yeah, you have the link in there. There's a video. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. So uh, Carnegie Mellon University, their bio robotics lab, have engineered what I call a snake bot. They didn't call it that in the article, so maybe I'll just TM that. But they engineered a robot that can coil itself around poles and trees. Um, so they're thinking that this can be extrapolated into a larger robot that then could be used to fit into areas where an, a robot with appendages couldn't fit. So maybe in a wreckage situation where they need to do search and rescue or some other sort of tight space, they could get in there. And so they already have a robot that can pretty much slither like a snake. They move without arms or legs, but now they have one that coils. So I'm going to stop mm -hmm. talking so you can see the video on the big screen. Yeah, it is. They're throwing this uh, metal segmented snake at the at a football football goalpost, and it's American football, not uh, soccer. And when it hits whatever object is, it's just wrapping itself around it, coiling. Wow! Over and over again. Now climb, snake, climb into the trees. That's one thing that terrifies me. Snakes in trees <laughs> drop onto your head. Mm -hmm. how, how often is that really going to happen in San Francisco? Katie? Thank goodness not very often. It's why There's I don't live in uh, Central snakes. South America or Africa or Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, and actually <laughs> or Florida can, now. Stay away from run, Florida. Oh, Florida. You can run into it in Napa too. I mean, it's, we got rattlesnakes throughout Cal, uh, California. Rattlesnakes aren't arboreal. <laughs> yes, they are. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. 
Not, not, they won't be in trees. <laughs> That's why I said Napa. Um, because they do climb up. This is one of the hidden dangers in harvesting grapes from the, from the wineries in California is that the, the rattlesnakes like to get up on the the grape, what do you call them, the things that the grapes grow on, the trellises or whatever those things are. Yeah, the are. vines. Yeah. The vines grow on. And because they're all about, you know, a person tall or so, you know, and, and they like to get up there because then they can get into the sun. So then the pickers going through sometimes are confronted with a rattlesnake right there, right in front of them. <laughs> ah! So that can happen. There's still danger from snakes. Yeah. Much danger from snakes. Yeah, really? Here, I found <laughs> one. I found one. Uh, following up, too, on, I've got a robot story. Uh, there is a researcher who just unveiled a large robotic jellyfish. Um, this is a 5 foot 7 inch long, 170 pound, looks very jellyfish ish and has the uh, autonomous robotic jellyfish type movements. Um, yeah, it's, uh, they're, they're thinking that they're going to use them for, for patrols in the water. The U.S. Naval Undersea Warfare Center and the Office of Naval Research is providing $5 million for this project. Um, I'm thinking, too, they could be uh, good harvesters for your tuna cats. Tuna cats. <laughs> so is this different from the robotic jellyfish that we saw f several months ago that could keep going potentially forever? You remember that? Yeah, this might be uh, this might be the same one, but with now it has funding from the Navy. <laughs> now it's got some money. Now it's going to be <sighs> under the oceans, keeping us safe from communism. Awesome. All right, everybody. I think that about does it for our show tonight. We've got uh, robots taking over the animal world and uh, brain damage whenever you think. So... Uh, and, oh yeah, the speed of light is no longer constant. So many things we've learned tonight, Except right? Except when it is. Except when it is. Then Except it's constant. When, and then it is constant mm -hmm. when it isn't fluctuating. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, i like to give a big shout out to Virgil Coralato over on Twitter because I uh, took suggestions for his stories this week. Thanks a lot for your suggestions. And Logan Waterman, thanks for your suggestion as well. Mm -hmm. And next week, um... Oh, I will really try to have an internet connection and do the show, even if it's from a laptop. I will have just moved on Wednesday and will be unpacking boxes and stuff, so I might be surrounded by boxes, but I will try. We'll be back on Google+, Plus, YouTube Live, using Hangouts on Air next Thursday, same time, same place. Follow us using, using social media and all that stuff. And, uh, yeah, we're done, right? Thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory, or if you have an Android device, you can look up Twist for Droid in the Android Google Play Marketplace. And also, we've got a TWIS app in the Apple Marketplace as well for the iPhone. That's right. And for more information on anything that you've heard here today, you can head on over to our website, twist.org, where, where we will have links to stuff, show notes. And we also want to hear from you, so why don't you send us an email, that old form of communication, you know. Uh, my email is kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. Justin's is justin at thisweekinscience.com. And Blair is blairbaz at gmail.com. Be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also contact us on the Twitter, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Flyer, at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that came to you in the night, please let us know. And we will be back here next week, just like I said. And we hope that you will join us once again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. <laughs> oh, what just happened here? You opened Capture. You, you hit a button. What happened? That was weird. What okay. The, what happened? Did you see what, what happened? happened? You have a camera that? next to your thing. I don't know what. That I don't know. I took a I picture, don't, right? I don't know what. Did it work? Does. Take snapshots. Snapshot. Wait. No, <laughs> episode back episode on title: Just oh. Take Their Children. <laughs> take 
take their children. That's what I love to do. I take a picture. Say something, and I'll take a picture of you, too. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? That one's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe uh, rattlesnakes climb grapevines. I had no idea. Oh, did you did you Google it to make sure I wasn't no. making it up? Oh, we no. should probably. Should I fact? I should. Yeah, did you I see the video? Me. Did you see the video I put up? No. Oh, did you put? No, we didn't see it. I couldn't see it. Oh, you couldn't see it. It was on see other it? screens at the time. Oh. But uh, I might not. It might have gone up, but I was cycling through to find my. Here, my, I'll sh here, I'll my, find it again. It was a rattlesnake up in a tree, and it was very scary. That's crazy because they're not arboreal snakes, like no. technically speaking. That's really weird. But you know, they I don't have... really have the body for it either. They don't even have the right uh, musculature to climb trees. But they can get up into the the grapevine thing. I know for sure because I've got friends can you in, see the, it right now? in the you keep talking industry that uh, you, have complained that is one of the biggest fears in their job is every once in a while rattlesnakes in the trellises rattlesnakes. Jeez. And this is not like close to the ground. This rattlesnake in this video. It's up in a tree. That's bizarre. Did I tell the uh, my rattlesnake story the on the show already? Oh my gosh! This is one one. Did I ever tell my rattlesnake story on the show? I probably no. did. I'm pretty sure I did. My rattlesnake encounter when I was like seven years old. I don't know. Um. Yeah. It was like I was living up in a in the boonies, up in the foothills of North San Juan, Northern California. Time was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and a young Justin had to go potty. Oh, gosh. So we got the flashlight and started following the crushed gravel path to the outhouse. Mm -hmm. When there in the high beam of the flashlight in the middle of the granite path, coiled up and waiting for him, was the biggest rattlesnake the world has ever seen. I'm not saying it was 10 feet tall versus 15 feet tall, but it was a big coil of snake. Yeah, it terrified me. And so like, I'm, I refuse to use outhouses ever since. So I, I, I have a couple follow-up questions. Huh? <laughs> so um, was it dirt all around except for the gravel path? Yes. 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 And uh, did it rattle at you at all? No. Okay. So rattlesnakes will not attack somebody because it uses so much of their energy to create venom that they're not going to strike something that isn't small enough for them to eat unless they absolutely have to. So that's why they have the rattle is to say, go away. I don't want to bite you. So if you don't hear the rattle... You're fine. You're safe. Yeah, you're fine. Well, I didn't get that close. The minute you hear the rattle, you get out. I saw it from a ways away with my keen vision and that strong flashlight. And then uh, um, I called my pops who took a shovel and did it in. Yeah. Aww. Uh, the other thing about rattlesnakes and venomous snakes, um, all snakes, actually. I forgot what I was going to say. All snakes Pay don't have uh, eyelids. So you can't tell if they're awake or they're asleep. Oh, I forgot about that. Um, mm. So he was, I'm sure he was asleep because it was nighttime. But do you know why he was on the gravel? Yes, I, I do. To kill you, right? No, that's why it was because it was the path between me and the outhouse. He was stalking, right. stalking me, staking out the right. right. I figured it was because the, the, probably the, the crushed granite held more heat than yes. the... Yes. That's why snakes get hit on uh, freeways all the time is because they go over there at night because the asphalt absorbs the heat during the day. That looks just like a giant... Wait, 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 wait. Don't say the word. Um, because it's not safe harbor yet. I don't know if that matters for the internet, but I, I don't think I'd do that with it, Kristen. That's... <laughs> It's legal in California, right? Yeah. Only if oh, you have a, a prescription. <laughs> Kaleidoscope. Ooh. No. Telescope. What is it? Laser tube. Oh, you've got a laser. I got a laser tube. Does anyone want to build a laser? Oh, yeah. my goodness. Let's you do know it. how to build a laser? I want to do it. Let's do it. I want to build a laser. <laughs> I want to help. 
few things would make me happier than life than than saying one day that I helped build a laser. Pew 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 pew. Pew pew. That's right. Laser tube. <sighs> this makes me happy. <laughs> little things. The science island defense systems equipment is finally arriving. Exactly. Mm. Yes, it is. Let's see. 1570 plus or minus 100 volts, 5 milliamps. What other info? 2 megawatt? It's like a big candle. It's a big candle. Right. <laughs> You're going to lose your tube. Hot Rod, you guessed it earlier? Did you seriously guess that when I showed it before the show? Shiny mirrors. Doot, doot. Freaking laser beams, right. Illegal in California. It's legal to own a... Can I mount lasers on my car in California? Is it legal? <laughs> That'd be pretty sweet. Wouldn't it be awesome? It's like, oh yeah, traffic? Pew! Pew! Not anymore. Yeah, so I'm thinking that I need to like build this as a little security device in the new house. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna laser. <laughs> Let's put it on a shark. Yes. Yes. Everybody needs freaking sharks with freaking laser beams on their heads. <laughs> laser beams. Oh, yeah, it would be nice, Burbles, if you could use it in the kitchen. Like, fine, you know, you can make finely sliced cheese. Do all your slicing that way. There's no cleanup. There's no blade to have to wash after. Just That's like if you had a lightsaber. I'd use it to cut things all the time. <laughs> hey, you've got a string hanging. you got a string hanging on it. Oh, I got it. <laughs> I'm reading people's comments. <laughs> Yeah, that's the part of the lightsaber that, like, otherwise I would say maybe we could come up with one one day, but the the fact that, you know, it has an end point, quite understand how that works. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a little... It doesn't really make sense. Lasers. There are people talking in my house. Who's in my house? Oh. I think I have guests. Oh. Marshall has guests. Mm -hmm. They're showing people through the maze of boxes. Mm. That's what's happening here. It's pretty I exciting. Know. Are you excited for your yeah. move? I am. I'm very excited, actually. You like the it's, new house? I do. Good. Yeah, it's a good new house. I mean, there are so many great things about this house but that I will miss, for sure. And the neighborhood is fantastic. But I will be very excited to embark on this new journey, new neighborhood. It's like a fresh start. Mm. Yeah. Fun. Ooh, can I boost the laser and write twists on the moon? Oh, I'd be like Chairface Chippendale. That would be awesome. I'm just moving inside San Francisco Rebar. I'm going to uh, Bernal Heights. Nice little neighborhood. It'll be fun. Identity Far, you wrote, thank you for recording. Oh, darned office Wi-Fi poopy times. <laughs> oh, I want to show you. I bought this amazing book. I'm going to go get it. I'll be right back. Wait, what? Right you back. have a book? Cool Yes, book. I want to show you. I'll be right back. You're leaving me alone with these people? Yes. Two seconds. <laughs> Two seconds. <laughs> Awesome. What cool things do I have to show you guys? Mm. I've been going through stuff. Who's here? Hi. Oh, cool. Oh, they came back from dinner. Awesome. I'll be done in a minute. I'm back. Yeah, we're done. Yeah. I'm back. Okay, so the lightsabers reminded me. Darth Vader and <laughs> <laughs> so let me see if this, let me find some of my favorite ones let's see ok 
Can you read that? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> That's funny. I am altering the deal. Pray I do not alter it any further. <laughs> look, Sorry, look at this one. Darling. I love this one. Cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Use the force, son. <laughs> look, of course, they had to go to the zoo. <laughs> of course. I love it. But in this book, Darth Vader's a really sweet dad. Aww. Well, you know, he job. would be, yeah. He's the kind of guy who cared. He did, he cared. <laughs> oh, did you guys watch the uh, the zombie movie I made for Kai? <laughs> Zombies for Kai? That sounds yeah. inappropriate. <laughs> no, he, so he has this garbage truck that he loves. And he plays, he got it for his birthday. Before his birthday, he was just watching garbage truck videos on YouTube all the time. And now he has his own garbage truck and he's very happy about it. But he also has little finger zombies and they have become the main garbage for his garbage truck. And so I videotaped the uh, zombies. Videotaped the zombies. Let's see if I can. Little Kai has zombie action figures. Little zombie finger guy. You see if I can bring it up. It's mine. I can bring it up. Mm. I don't like zombies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared. No, you're gonna like this, but I wish that you could hear the music. I'm gonna. I'll give you the uh, the link so that you can watch it yourself and hear it because it's really pretty awesome. Oh, wait, that's not what it is. Browse my videos. Browse my videos. It's called oh, zombie. Here's my favorite one. It's called zombie mess. It says, "I don't want a sister." I'll share this with you. I don't want a sister. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me zoom this. Do 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 do. Come on, get bigger. Do it. Get bigger. Okay. All right. Where are you? Okay. Screen share. And then, not that snake. Whoa! That was loud all of a sudden. Ah! The advertising attack at me. How do I screen share here? What is the window? There it is. All right. Oh, come on, make the ad go away. Hmm. Hold on. You guys don't need to see the battle. Oh, wait. Why does this? This isn't even my thing. This is stupid. Where'd my thing go? <laughs> Here we are. You should hear the music, too, that goes along with it. It makes it wonderful. Kiki, you have to talk so it's the big one. Oh, the big one. <laughs> yeah, you guys have to watch it on your own systems because it's, <laughs> it's just hilarious. It cracks me up. It makes me laugh. My finger pump it, my finger puppet zombie movie. <laughs> Is it on your YouTube station? It's on, yeah, uh, Kiki, my Kiki Sanford YouTube the, station. Oh, Kiki Sanford, okay. Yeah. Great. Great. What are they doing? People are doing things. What's going on out there? Uh -huh. People are doing things. I'm watching it right tomorrow. now. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, this I'm, is like some high production value. 
on right? your movie. This, yeah. This was um, it's um, what's it called? Hi. It's what you call it, movie uh, maker. Outside. iMovie. They have templates. Wow. Really amazing. Yeah. Outside. You can make a template. iMovie. It's amazing. He loves his zombies, his garbage can zombies. Any of you who have uh, <laughs> children out there. That's fantastic. Yeah, and there's another one that's just video of him playing with his zombies. It's the, you know, it's the whole movie. <laughs> hey, look, there's a child back there. Privacy. We'll have some privacy here. Huh? 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, adjust position of chair. This is what I have done. And you can see my boxes. More boxes here. Mm. And a feather duster. For dusting, because moving means there's a lot of dust. <sighs> Anywho, uh, I should probably go. It's almost 9.30. Okay. I think there are people who have come to visit my house. Okay. Oh. All right, I'm going to go say hi to them. What happened? It? What happened? It? All right, good night, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. We will see you next week again for yeah. more This Week in Science, plus This Week in Science after show. Just like that. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>